Good morning and welcome once again to St Swithin's Anglican Church in Pimble. We're continuing to look at Matthew's Gospel and the events that led up to the first Easter. Jesus has just celebrated the Passover with his disciples and they're on the way to the Mount of Olives. The narrative just seems to pause for a moment as Jesus makes an ominous prediction. But before I read, may we pray. Heavenly Father, please open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive your word to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, I'm reading from Matthew's Gospel in the New International Version, and I'm going to start reading chapter 26, verse 31. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. This very night, before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. How loyal are we? Would we lay down our life for another person? Or take the blame for someone else? Go to prison for no fault of our own? Take Jesus' way and turn the other cheek? Peter was vehement in his declaration of loyalty. No matter what anyone else does, he says, I will never leave you. But Jesus knows better. He knows our human frailty how fear can take over and command our actions, how when we try to do things in our own strength, we often do and say things we don't really want to. The next 10 verses show us very clearly the difference between going our way or God's way. I'm reading now from verse 36. Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit over there while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is the last time that we'll see the disciples together until Jesus' resurrection. They will all be scattered, just as the prophet Zechariah had predicted. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock 
and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So they went to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means oil press, so it may have been more than just an olive grove. And there's something very symbolic about the oil being squeezed out of the olives as Jesus' agony is squeezed out of him. The early Christians saw great symbolism too in the contrast between Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, which was the cause and origin of evil and separation from God, and Jesus' obedience to God's will in the Garden of Gethsemane, which restored humanity's relationship with him. Many years ago, I remember going to the National Gallery in London and seeing a very large medieval painting of the sleeping disciples. They were depicted just as we read in this passage in all their human frailty, tired, heads lolling forward on their chest or flung back with mouths wide open. There was humour in the painting, but the artist had betrayed them as Jesus saw them in all their vulnerability. Against that scene, we have Jesus' agony, his knowledge of what lies ahead, and his desperate cry to God to let him off the hook. Three times he looks for human support and finds the disciples sleeping. Three times he cries out to God to save him from the inevitable. Three times he says, not my will, but yours. I'd be surprised if there were any of us who haven't experienced something similar to that, who haven't cried out, please don't let this happen, Lord. Prayer seeks to surrender to the will of God. We don't always get what we want, but we do get the strength to deal with the situation. In Nicky Gumbel's words, when you are deeply depressed, overwhelmed with sorrow, troubled or in the middle of tough times, it's such an encouragement to know that Jesus has experienced all that you face and far more. He knows what you're going through and you can follow his example by submitting your ways to God. So let's pray. There, in the garden of tears, my heavy load he chose to bear. His heart with sorrow was torn, yet not my will, but yours, he said. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Lord, Help us to follow your example and pray, yet not as I will, but as you will. May your will be done. Amen.